Welcome back to those who are uh, still here and those who may still be coming in. We're going to continue with our program here in uh, this room. And uh, coming up next is something that I've been talking to a lot of my friends and family, uh, their families, about this technique. And I know we've all heard about it. And uh, this will be interesting to hear what's new. So this is um, our next guest. It's uh, Dr. Jeremy Greenlee. He's from the University of Iowa. And the topic for this discussion will be the deep brain stimulation. And the question is, is it right for me? Doctor? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to come speak to you today. It's nice to be able to do this in person after the last few years off um, because this is a fantastic opportunity for you and friends and family to come, come together as a group. Uh, and that's a very powerful thing. And, and of all the diseases I treat, the Parkinson's support network in this state is, is unmatched, I think. And uh, so that's a, a nice opportunity for you all to have and to benefit from. So. My specific topic today is about deep brain stimulation. Uh, and uh, there's always a lot of questions about is it right for me and when is the right time and those kind of things that we'll talk about. But um, I don't have any affiliation with any of the DBS companies uh, that we'll hear uh, talked about today. I do receive uh, research support from the government uh, to do research and some of that's focused on Parkinson's disease specifically. We'll touch on that at the end. So surgery for Parkinson's disease has a very long history. It dates back to the early 1930s, actually, and they uh, anecdotally found that patients that had strokes in a certain part of the brain actually developed improvement in their Parkinson's symptoms. So that then led to going into uh, basically ligate or tie off blood vessels on purpose to cause strokes in this little area to try to help Parkinson's disease. Uh, which is a little bit unreliable, but then that evolved into more nuanced kind of fine-grained lesions, we call them, where basically you, you burn a little hole in the brain. So you can see a little white spot um, up on the, the right side of that brain scan. That's an MRI scan. That little white spot is what happens when you lesion the brain. So we can do lesions. We used to do it with heat, um, and now you can do it with ultrasound, uh, which is kind of gaining popularity again, and we can also do it with focused radiation. Another way to create a lesion, uh, or more like a virtual lesion or a temporary lesion, is with brain stimulation. Uh, and brain stimulation has been done for decades also, uh, but now because we're doing deep targets in the brain, that's why you hear it referred to as deep brain stimulation. So the targets that we're trying to, to stimulate are basically in the center of the head. Uh, and there's different targets that we use for different diseases, but for Parkinson's disease, there's two main targets that we go after. Uh, we'll talk about those, but this is, this is one of those targets uh, lesioned right there. So in general, we have found over the decades since DBS has been out, uh, it's been FDA approved since the 1990s. So we now have coming up on 30 years of data to know that it's safe and effective and uh, does, does its job very well. This is not advancing. If I can get the next slide. So why would I think about having surgery on my brain to help Parkinson's disease? Um, and the short answer is that studies have compared patients that have surgery with stimulation and patients that are just on their best medical management and the patients that have had the stimulation and in addition to their medications, which you'll still have to be taking, patients with the DBS have been shown to have improved motor function. So they get improved on time during the day. I'll, I'll explain that to you in a second. But uh, basically, you get another six up to eight hours of on time each day, which is a lot out of a 24-hour day. We know that DBS is very effective at lessening or improving dyskinesias. So many of you are probably familiar with that. But if you're not, those are kind of the wiggly movements that sometimes when your medications kick in and you can't sit still, those kind of writhing movements are called dyskinesias, which are a side effect of the medications that, that help the motor symptoms. And because the motor function improves, patients can get away taking a little bit less medication. So it's pretty uncommon for patients to be able to go off all Parkinson's medications. We don't, we don't expect that or we don't counsel patients that you'll be able to stop taking your medications, but you might be on half as much as before. Uh, and sometimes that can help with side effects of the medications themselves if the stimulator is helping. And for all those reasons listed, we know that patients report improved quality of life uh, with the DBS compared to just the medication alone. So the, the on time that I'm talking about is kind of shown graphically here. So 
if you think about kind of over the course of a day, sometimes uh, you'll be very stiff and frozen and, and we call that off where it's hard to move. Your movements are much slower. Uh, and then when you take your medication, so time zero is where this arrow is on the bottom of that uh, X time axis on the bottom. So you take your medications and then you enter the on phase. That's where you, your hands and arms and legs loosen up and you can move better, you can walk better. Uh, you don't have as much tremor, for example. Um, and then the medication early in the disease kind of lasts a long time and you can get eight hours out of a dose, for example. And then as you kind of drift back down to that red off phase, it's time for another dose of medicine. So the problem is as the disease progresses, uh, you have to have higher doses of medicines. They don't last as long. So when you take your medicine at time zero, you can have a very short time in the green phase, which is the good phase or the on phase. And then sometimes because of these higher doses, you get the drug-induced side effects like dyskinesias, for example. So then you have this very kind of uh, exaggerated cycle from the bad times to the good times, uh, and they, they happen much more frequently. So sometimes patients will be taking medications every two hours. Um, so that improved on time that I'm talking about in the, in the stimulators uh, uh, studies, uh, it lengthens that duration in the green phase, what we want all patients to be in all the time if we can do that. So that's at a kind of a group level, but from, a, from an individual level, how do we know if a patient is a great candidate, an okay candidate, or not a good candidate for DBS? Uh, again, this is one of the few things that we can actually simulate to, um, that's simulate, not stimulate, to a sense of what to expect after surgery. Uh, by doing this on and off medication test. So we do a, kind of a detailed neurological examination to make sure we're not treating something other than Parkinson's disease and make sure that uh, it looks like the very kind of typical characteristic Parkinson's and it's not uh, um, some other Parkinson's variant, for example. But if we do this levodopa challenge, it's called, or actually your neurologist will do that with you, but basically you don't take any of your Parkinson's medicines for eight or 10 or 12 hours. You come in that morning off of all your medicine, uh, your neurologist kind of just does a bedside check and they give you a rating score. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to know what the medicines are doing if you've been taking medications for years until you stop them. And then you can see how bad things would be without the medicines. But then while you're in the office, the neurologist will have you take your, your normal dose of medicine and they kind of give you another rating scale. And we want to see your rating scores get at least 30% better with the medications. And that's very important uh, for us, and it's very educational for you to see exactly what the medications help. Because in a sense, the stimulator is going to help the same things that the medications help, the things that the medic or the symptoms that you might have that the medications don't seem to ever benefit is probably unlikely to be benefited by the stimulator. So that gives you a very clear understanding of, of what kind of expectations to have going into surgery of, of what can I realistically think is going to get better. And then the last thing we do is a screening test is called a neuropsychological test. And that's just a pencil and paper test that's done with a neuropsychologist. It's about two hours long, actually. But it's a screening test for dementia, uh, which is one, one factor that we, don't, uh, we know that does not get better with, with DBS. Um, but it also checks the different kinds of mood, anxiety, uh, attention, concentration, and kind of gives us an assessment, objective measure of how is your cognitive function to know what is the best target for you and should we, should we reconsider surgery if, if the cognitive effects are really, really impacted by the disease. So kind of the, the cookbook list here is uh, kind of what we go through to make sure that all those boxes are checked to know are you a, a very good candidate for the surgery. So idiopathic Parkinson's disease is one specific subtype of Parkinson's. It's the most common kind. Um, but Parkinson's Plus or other variants uh, aren't as reliable to improve with DBS, so that's kind of a, a contraindication for us. DBS generally helps the motor symptoms of the disease itself, and some of the non-motor side effects of the disease uh, we know don't get better with DBS, so we want the motor symptoms to be kind of front and center, and that's what is, is lessening your day-to-day -day quality of life. So those motor fluctuations I'm talking about, if you remember that curve um, with big ups and downs during the day, um, and the dyskinesias, both of those get very much improved with DBS. 
And again, we want you to be responsive to the, the dopamine agonist medications, the Cinemet, the Salivo, um, and the, the Levodopa, because that's what the stimulator is going to help. So it gives us a, a, a peace of mind that we know we're going to make you better with the stimulator. The, the other atypical Parkinsonian features is what we kind of look out for, um, kind of getting back to point number one up there, but any kind of gaze palsies or, or really bad blood pressure uh, drops or fluctuations um, or really bad postural instability or, or prominent gait symptoms, those are things that the stimulator doesn't really benefit. We talked about the screening for dementia. Um, and the psychiatric disease, like severe depression or severe anxiety, can be managed, and those are not absolute contraindications to surgery, but it's just something that we want to pay attention to uh, when you go through the stress of surgery, for example, in dealing with a, a disease like Parkinson's disease. So that has to have some attention paid to that also. Um, and the gait, generally the DBS is not going to improve your gait uh, if it's just kind of unsteadiness. Um, which is different than if your legs are so stiff and crampy that you can't walk because of that and your medications help you walk better. Um, but if it's just an imbalance or, or bad postural instability, that's not going to improve with the DBS. Age um, is all relative. Um, so there's no hard and fast cutoff below which you're too young or above which you're too old. But we want to make sure that you're um, both physically and, and medically and cognitively uh, in good enough health, in general health, to tolerate having surgery, um, but also um, tolerate a general anesthetic, for example, to put the devices in. Um, so we want to make sure that diabetes and blood pressure and all those other medical comorbidities are taken care of um, to, to lessen the risks. And the final point here on the list is you have to have a supportive social environment because this is not just a one-and-done type surgery. It's a commitment, so you have to come back, you have to have your tune-ups with your neurologist, uh, you have to have your medications adjusted on top of that. So and really, my job is the easy part, putting the stimulator in. The neurologists have the hard part of adjusting the medications, finding what frequency is best and what contacts are best and what voltage is best. So you have to have that uh, supportive environment to make it back and forth to your neurology appointments uh, to get those adjustments. And then eventually these batteries um, will have to be replaced, whether that's two years or 15 years, so that's more surgery to replace that when they get low. So the way I put these stimulators in is usually with two different surgeries. Um, and almost always it's both sides of the brain to help the opposite side of the body. So in rare cases, if it's a very one-sided uh, disease or symptoms, uh, we can do this on one side of the body only. Uh, but usually by the time patients make it to me, they have uh, effects on both sides of the body um, and we put both, both brain leads at the same time. So the first surgery, you put the brain wires in um, and then you recover from that, you go home and then we do the second surgery uh, to put in the extension wires and the battery pack. So the first surgery is the technical one and that's when we uh, have to accurately hit these very small targets in the brain which are about the size of a pea in the center of your head. So we use computer guidance to do that, um, and they also that requires a halo to be put on. I'll show you a picture of that to be sure that we can hit that target. Um, if we absolutely have to, we could do the surgery asleep, uh, but I, I really like the flexibility and the accuracy and, and the targeting, of which I think is more accurate if you're awake, but you do get uh, sedation with strong IV medications with an anesthesiologist who's kind of standing right beside you for that. So it sounds pretty daunting to think about an awake operation, but with the numbing medicine, small incisions, and those uh, powerful short-acting sedatives, patients tolerate it very well. The second surgery is much easier. You're totally asleep for that whole surgery. But in general, a DBS system has three main components to it. So the one is the brain wire, which goes from that target in the center of your head. Uh, the entry points are kind of up here above your, behind your hairline with a small inch and a half incision on either side. Um, so the brain lead, we call it, has multiple contacts on the bottom of it. You see the uh, sample pictures on the right of the screen there. And they come in different kind of shapes and sizes and spacing, um, but they're all really small. So they're about a millimeter and a half long for each contact. Um, and they differ across vendors a little bit. Some will have, most these days have eight contacts on them. Um, and that gives the neurologist flexibility to kind of fine tune that stimulator field to make you as good as you can possibly be. The second component of the system is the extension wire. 
Uh, and usually the brain wires get tunneled out um, kind of above and behind your ear. And then they attach to an extension wire, which is also tunneled under the skin from kind of above your ear, down the side of your neck, down to your chest. Uh, and then the third component is the battery, uh, or it's a pulse generator. So if you hear people talk about an IPG, that's what they're talking about. So it's all implanted under the skin. Um, and we can, can and, and sometimes do have to replace one of those three components if, uh, if there be a problem or a crack or a fracture or things like that. But obviously the most challenging piece to replace or to put in is the brain wire itself. So the brain wires both go in the first surgery. The second surgery is 10 days later and that's when we connect the brain wires with the extension wires and put the battery pack in. That second surgery is an outpatient surgery. The first surgery, usually it's one or two nights in the hospital just for observation. So the computer guidance I talked about, whether you're awake or asleep, uh, requires some type of a stereotactic frame, it's called, or, or it's easier to call it a halo. Um, so it's basically, uh, sorry, it's a one inch metal ring that kind of goes right at the tip of your nose, kind of around your head. Um, and then it has those four little uprights, which you can see there, which, um, where it gets attached. So the morning of surgery, we put it on before the surgery so we can get kind of a guidance scan with it on. Um, and then we inject a whole lot of numbing medicine at each one of those entry points. Um, and then we uh, tighten it down. Um, so you can see this is uh, a gentleman that's even able to smile after we put it on. Um, but it, your, your eyes are open, so you can see your mouth is open. So once it's on, you kind of feel like your head's getting squeezed for about 15 minutes. And it's, after that, it's not too uncomfortable to have it on. Um, and this will stay on throughout the duration of the surgery. Uh, as soon as the surgery is done, that comes off. Um, so you don't have to go home with that thing, thankfully. But um, once it's on, then we get a CAT scan, which is uh, easier and faster to do than an MRI scan, for example. You've probably had some of these scans, but the CT scan is a much larger diameter open donut, so just your head goes inside it basically. Whereas an MRI scanner, it's more like a longer tube, uh, a little bit more narrow, so your whole body goes into that for an MRI scan. So we do an MRI scan um, just as part of a, a clinic appointment uh, without the halo on, and then we can combine the CT scan with the MRI scan once the ring is on for our computer guidance. So we pick the target, um, and as I mentioned, there's, there's three different targets that we can use for Parkinson's disease, uh, and which of those three we would use for you depends on a conversation that I would have with your neurologist of what they think is the best target based on your symptoms. Uh, but the, the most common target that we use is called the subthalamic nucleus, or STN is what it's abbreviated. Regardless, the, that process is the same of, of doing the MRI scan uh, in the clinic, uh, the CT scan and the halo the morning of surgery. We merge those two together. This is what an MRI scan looks like. So it's uh, a very high resolution scan and, and we can see these little targets on there. Um, and as opposed to a CT scan, which is a much more grainy picture, uh, kind of like this, uh, which is why we, why we use the two together to get the, the resolution of the MRI, but the speed of a CT scan. And then we, uh, the computer kind of calculates, you can kind of see those uh, nine white circles around the edge. Those are the markers from the frame or, or sitting on the halo. So the computer is able to triangulate from those points where is that target that we need to hit, which is good, but it's not a perfect system. So in general, we're probably plus or minus two millimeters of accuracy uh, with this kind of computer targeting. And in general, that's pretty good, but we can refine that even better with the testing that we do during surgery, um, which is why I like to do it awake. Um, so after that scan's done, the targeting's done, you go into the operating room, uh, and you're kind of in uh, almost like a beach chair type position. So the halo gets attached to a little holder, so it holds your head up and it holds it still, so it's not gonna move. The rest of your body, you can move, you can shift around, um, and you can kind of see how you can see out the bottom of the halo there. Um, so your mouth is open, we can talk to you, and, and all those blue drapes and everything keeps everything sterile on the backside, um, but you can, uh, we can check your muscle tone and, and have you move uh, while you're positioned on that table. That other little uh, black and white plastic covered thing is an is a x-ray machine, so we can get x-rays to be sure that we're, we have those electrodes in a good spot and we don't move them uh, accidentally, for example. 
So the most accurate way to kind of find these targets, and we can say, okay, this is the top of the target, this is the bottom of the target, is to actually listen to your brain cells. So through those uh, small incisions and with the computer guidance, we use these little, uh, almost like needle point microelectrodes, uh, and that allows us to listen to your brain cells fire, and that tells us exactly where we are. And usually we use three of these electrodes at once. Um, so that tells us, are we in the front of the target? Are we in the middle of the target? Are we, are we behind the target, for example? Uh, and if we can play that sound, you'll be able to hear what this sounds like. If you uh, hover over that speaker. So all of my training from watching black and white TV when I was a kid paid off for this. Uh, but that static actually is very clear. It's hard to tell in here, but that tells us exactly because that static changes uh, when you're above the target. It gets pretty quiet. And then when you go into the target, it gets really loud because we're basically hearing individual nerve cells kind of popping off and firing. So if there's a lot of cells firing, it gets really loud. And we can see it on a computer screen. Um, with kind of lines like this on the left, um, you kind of see that little yellow line. And you see all those little skinny lines coming down That's what, as we're going down into the brain, and you can see that swath uh, where all those lines get really thick. That tells us where the top is, where the bottom is, and where exactly we want to put that electrode. Nowadays, the computers have gotten better, and they actually give us a prediction or a recommendation of those three electrodes, for example, which one the computer thinks is best. And almost always it matches what I think is best, but uh, this kind of technology to give us uh, objective measurements of, of, of which, which thick uh, pass is best going through that nucleus. And in, in this case, you can see those three electrodes. Electrode one in that box on the right, you see that big black bump. Uh, that's all that nucleus. And electrodes two and three are actually ba base, basically skiving that nucleus on the back of it. So that would tell us Electrode one here is very good, and that's what we want to use. Uh, so this will compensate for that plus or minus two millimeters of accuracy that we have from the computer guidance. So then what we do is um, take those microelectrodes out, and then we put the DBS lead in. Um, so we know where to put it, we know what depth to put it at, and then we have you do little tests where you tap your finger to your thumb, or pretend you're screwing in a light bulb. Um, and then we can uh, have you move your hands. You can see the patient's there holding up his hand, uh, pretend you're eating, pretend you're drinking, and generally on the table we'll see tremor get better, we'll see the stiffness get better, uh, and we do the surgery with you off of your medicine also, so the stiffness and, and those kind of things are very clear for us to see get better. But it's as important to know that we can turn that stimulator up to a very high setting um, so that if we know things get worse down the road, and say your neurologist has to go up to five volts, for example, you have that luxury down the road without being limited by side effects or for a little bit off target. Because we know that targeting for this is everything. So if we're a little bit too far to the back, um, that's when we get into the sensory fibers in the brain. So you get kind of tingling or buzzing feelings in your fingers, which is a good sign to know that we're close to it. We want it to go away. We don't want you to have to live with that every day because that's, again, going to limit the settings that the neurologist would have to choose from. On the other hand, if we're a little bit out to the side or if we're too far forward, then you can get actually stiffness that gets worse from the stimulator. So uh, these are the three ways that we can be sure that we hit that spot. And um, I mean, I've done this, I don't know, 500 patients. Uh, and we know with this technique, our, our accuracy is very good and it's almost uh, unheard of to have to go in and reposition an electrode that we didn't place very well, which is good because we, we want to do this surgery once and not twice. So once you get those electrodes in, we kind of coil them up under the scalp. We kind of close up those inch and a half incisions. We take that halo and the frame off, and then we get you back on your medicines as soon as we're done, and then you spend the night in the hospital just for observation. Uh, nowadays, you get a CAT scan afterwards and some x-rays to kind of see how those electrodes sit. Uh, and we know, because they can be pointed different directions, uh, and that's going to help the neurologist down the road when they do the programming. So you go home, you recover, and then you come back in for the second surgery, like I say, in, in 10 days or two weeks later. Um, so that one, you're totally asleep, no halo. You can stay on your medicines right up until the time they put you asleep. We do the tunneling, put the device in, um, close everything up, wake you up, and then you go home that same day. Um, and you still have to recover from that, so it's not turned on that day. 
Uh, and usually we wait about four to six weeks until it gets turned on, so all the temporary effects from the, from the first surgery primarily are gone um, before it gets turned on. So for sure you will notice some temporary effects from putting the wires in the brain, so we call that a lesion effect. Um, kind of like the, that first slide I showed you where there's a, the, the hole burned in your brain from the lesions. The, the electrodes are not burning a hole in the brain, but they do disrupt a tiny little brain tissue. So you're not going to feel like your normal self mentally or physically. Usually it takes about 10 days or so to kind of feel like you bounce back to yourself. So some patients will be sleepy. Some patients might be a little bit confused um, and just kind of not as sharp and not want to do, do as much as normal. Then that kind of fades away. The, the good lesion effect is you may notice that your medications tend to work better. You may not notice as much stiffness or slowness or tremor. Uh, but then a, that also kind of reverts back to normal, uh, like I say, 10 days to two weeks after the first surgery. So uh, after that initial programming, the neurologist will go through and test every one of those eight contacts on each side of the brain. So that takes a while to do. Uh, but then that tells us which contact is the best. Um, and then you have to come back in probably a month after that for your second tune-up. And then once, you, once your neurologist finds that sweet spot, it's probably every three months or four months uh, just for those adjustments. Um, batteries now, there's rechargeable batteries, there's non-rechargeable batteries. We usually start out with a non-rechargeable because sometimes they would last for uh, six or seven years if you're on really low settings. Uh, that we don't have to worry about charging it. But if you, if you do um, have to have battery changes every two years, for example, you can be converted to a rechargeable battery down the road. Um, and it's just like charging a, a cell phone, for example, where you're not plugged into the wall, but you have a little hockey puck thing on your chest that charges the battery if you're kind of sitting still. So that's a good option. The rechargeable ones can last up to 15 years, but it is more surgery to replace any battery with the reopening of this chest scar. Uh, and again, that's an outpatient surgery. So the benefits can be way up here if, if your tremor is better and your uh, stiffness and all those things and less medications. But we know that uh, any surgery and, and any brain surgery is, is a critical surgery. You, you can have some side effects or problems from the surgery. Um, and we also know that Parkinson's, unfortunately, is a progressive disease. There's not great data that shows that DBS will slow down progression. There's some coming out now that says maybe it does slow down the progression a little bit, but that's not well established. Um, but even if the disease progresses, it's, it's an adjustable system, so it can gradually be turned up if you're noticing that things are kind of getting worse years down the road. So uh, infection is one thing that I worry about a lot, um, and we know that happens in our, in our series about 3.5% of the time, which is, is national average. But if you get an infection, the, the wires can be uh, covered with bacteria, and sometimes you can't just eradicate the infection with uh, antibiotics alone, and sometimes we have to take part of, or worst case, take the whole system out and start all over again. Um, so that's a bummer for everybody. Uh, but thankfully, that's only about a 3.5% uh, rate. These wires are designed to be very small for a reason, so they don't disrupt a lot of brain tissue, but we want them to be kind of robust so they can tolerate fishing and golfing and hiking and normal activity without breaking, but if you would have a big fall or land right on a wire or get in a car accident, sometimes these sands, things can break and you have to replace whichever component might be broken. Uh, that's pretty uncommon, probably 2% or less, I would say. Um, the risk of having a stroke or bleeding in the brain anytime you pass a wire into the brain uh, is not zero. It's about 2%. So we try to pick kind of quiet areas of the brain to go through. If you would have a little hemorrhage or a blood clot, you may not notice any symptoms of it. Uh, if you had a very large blood clot in the center of, of the brain, that could be a, a different story and could even be fatal. But again, the risk of any kind of bleeding is about 2%. So thankfully, that's a low, low rate. But we pay close attention to blood pressure when we're putting these wires in to make sure it's not too high, for example. If you're on blood thinners like an aspirin or uh, Plavix or things like that, we want you to stop those for surgery um, so you're not more at risk of bleeding, for example. And then you can be put back on that after the surgeries are done. The risk of uh, a poorly placed electrode is less than one out of 100 easily. Um, but it is, even though it's, it's sedation and, and not general anesthetic for both cases, uh, there are risks of just having surgery in general, like blood clots and heart attacks and things like that. So we want to make sure you're as tuned up coming into a surgery as possible. And then those temporary effects we talked about. 
So this is what a brain hemorrhage looks like. This is a CAT scan on the, on the left side of the screen. You can kind of see the, the little bright white dot. That's actually the wire itself. And then that little more fuzzy, hazy white area around it is a blood clot. Uh, so thankfully in this case, this was a small, pretty superficial blood clot. This patient didn't have any symptoms uh, permanently and that blood kind of just gradually goes away. So again, that risk is uh, probably 2%. The risk of a... Um, I mean, these wires, as I mentioned, are, are designed to be small, but sometimes uh, with thin scalps or things like that, they can erode through the scalp. Uh, this is a gentleman that came in with his wires sticking out of his head, um, which didn't happen overnight, but thankfully we were able to kind of uh, close up the scalp and keep it covered and, and leave that system in place. This is kind of a magnified view of an x-ray here, and you can kind of see a little notch in that wire uh, kind of towards the top half of the screen, right where that arrow is. That's what a partial break of a wire looks like from a fall. Uh, and we can tell from checking the, the connectivity of the system in the office, is, is one contact broken? Is, are all the contacts broken or is, are none of the contacts broken? So that gives us, um, uh, again, good technology to investigate the system. So it's pretty common for us to do these surgeries. Um, you can kind of see or it kind of flattens off when the pandemic starts, but uh, right now we'll probably do about 60 new patients a year uh, at the university, which is a pretty, doesn't sound like a big number, but that probably puts us in the top 20 of the country for n volume of patients that are, are, are getting these implants. Um, the two different targets uh, that we talked about, this, the subthalamic nucleus is probably nine out of 10 patients that we implant. Um, whereas the globus pallidus is that GPI, uh, we still do one or two a year. We typically do those more if, if there is some degree of cognitive impairment uh, or if dyskinesias are, are really the only symptom, but uh, most patients, uh, we think STN is the best target. Um, but as good as this technology is, we need to do better. Um, and we wanna, from, from a disease standpoint, the biggest question is how can we slow down or stop the Parkinson's from progressing with or without surgery? So there's a lot of research efforts going on uh, for that with medications, for example. Um, but the other thing is DBS doesn't do anything to improve cognition. Um, so what techniques or, or things can we come up with to help improve uh, cognitive effects? And, and we know that cogn cognition is very in commonly affected by the disease itself in up to 90% of patients at some point in the disease process. The other thing is DBS doesn't generally help speech. Uh, most patients don't notice a big change in speech either way. Speech, again, is commonly impacted by Parkinson's, but um, it's unpredictable if, of some patients with DBS get a little bit of improvement in speech. Most patients don't notice a difference, and some patients actually get a little bit worse uh, where the voice gets softer or, or not as crisp articulation as before. So we're doing studies to try to figure out uh, why that happens. Um, and we're particularly interested at the university in, in both cognition and speech. So we have studies going on. If you're interested, uh, email me, and I can get you hooked up with the right people. But surgery in, in DBS is kind of a, a great time point around, to, uh, around which to do uh, studies and research because we can study patients before they have the surgery uh, we can study patients during surgery if that's an option that you're interested in. We can record brain waves, for example. Um, and then after surgery to see how things change over time, uh, the farther you get out from DBS. But also we can turn the stimulator off in the clinic and see immediately what is the stimulator improving, what's it worsening, and, and what happens when you turn it right back on. Um, so again, we have several studies with uh, scientists at the university to try to investigate these questions. Thankfully, the technology itself is always improving. So there's now a competition in the market. There's three vendors that make these systems. It's kind of like cars where there is no perfect car. Uh, you have Chevy people, you have Ford people, and these companies do the same thing where they all have their diff different little nuances, and, and that's good for us as, as clinicians. It's also good for you as patients to have options, and they kind of uh, need that competition to make themselves better. One way they have gotten better is, is now these are uh, kind of segmented or directional leads where those contacts are kind of um, made smaller and you can actually shape that electrical field a little bit more to the left or more to the right uh, to, uh, again, make you as good as you can be. Um, and then the final thing is uh, now systems are being designed to actually sense your brain rhythms after they're implanted. 
to know that if one frequency band is too high or one frequency band is too low, we'll be able to adjust the stimulator kind of on the fly to make you as good as you can be. So that's exciting technology coming down the pipe that even the batteries we put in now have that technology in them, but it's just not unlocked because we don't know yet how to use it. Um, but hopefully that'll be unlocked uh, soon down the road to kind of help. So to wrap up, we know that DBS is common. We know that it's safe. We know that it's very effective at improving the quality of life for, for patients with Parkinson's disease. We also know that it's not for everyone, um, but it, it is a commitment. And if you have that commitment and you kind of uh, meet all those screening criteria, uh, generally it's very rewarding to see patients um, coming back to clinic like new people, or even for me to bump into familiar faces here that have had surgery um, that came to this talk a few years ago and, and see how their life has improved with it. So be happy to answer any questions. And um, this is my team behind me that helps make my job easy. So uh, my email address is on the bottom. Uh, and this, this slide set should be as part of your handout. So any questions, concerns, uh, interest in research or whatever, email me anytime. Thank you. Yeah. It's a good question. So uh, these, the, the wires are about the size of a, a normal size spaghetti pasta noodle, so two millimeters in diameter. So we do have to make a nick in the brain to get the wires to go in from the top. Um, and then they do disrupt that kind of two millimeter diameter cylinder all the way down to the target. Um, and that's part of why you have that, that lesion effect afterwards temporarily. Uh, but that lesion effect generally goes away within, for sure, six weeks. Um, so it does uh, a tiny amount of damage, but generally once you're healed up, it's not a noticeable effect that you would see. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question, and the short answer is, is probably that I don't know about, but um, we have done some work at the university with, um, I mean, it's, it's a related but somewhat different area where we have kind of um, a coil that gets implanted in the brain for, for blood vessel reasons. We're trying to record brain waves from those and we have a partnership trying to induce an electrical field wirelessly through that. So um, I'm sure in our lifetime that technology will come out but it's not commercially available now. That's a very good question. Um, the short answer is probably not, but we don't want, um, there's kind of a sweet spot where we want to optimize um, your quality of life, uh, and we don't want kind of cognition to kind of go south while we're waiting. Um, I mean, there is no kind of right or wrong easy, uh, answer of is two years better than five years or 10 years from diagnosis. I always tell patients a very individualized decision and, and some patients would say I've, uh, I've had this tremor for a long time and I do just fine with the medicine and I don't want to have surgery. Other patients would say well I shake so much I can't cross stitch, I can't tie flies and I don't like living like this, I want to be better. So it's, there's kind of a spectrum of, of knowing what those risks are, they're low but um, the payoff is, is up to individual patient of, of what you're trying to get out of it. Um, but that's, that's an answer that a lot of patients and even us as clinicians struggle with of, of when is the right time. But generally, we kind of leave it up to the patients. And as long as you kind of meet those criteria, whenever you think you're ready, it's the right time. Yeah. It varies a lot, so um, depends on uh, how much of the, the preoperative testing your neurologist has done. So, I mean, a lot of times everything is done by the time I even meet a patient, in which case it's kind of a, a one-time chat, kind of make sure all the criteria line up, um, and then we could schedule surgery date that day while I'm meeting you in the office. Others uh, have not seen a movement disorder neurologist specialist or have not, any, not met somebody that can do the programming. So that, that would take probably a couple of months to kind of go through that process. So um, in general, it's, it's pretty quick because uh, a lot of neurologists around the state are very good about knowing what to look for and what to do. Uh, and they can do a lot of that legwork to kind of save you time. 
Dr. Uch? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, so he, he's one of our university movement disorders uh, neurologists, and he knows exactly what to do for things like this. Um, so some patients kind of move along pretty quickly, and some patients uh, are understandably a little bit more hesitant or, or try different medications or medication dosages. So it's, it's a process for everybody, but sometimes it happens pretty quickly. Can you exercise through the process? Uh, yes. So we want you, we, we like the incisions to be clean and not get hot and sweaty and dirty and dusty and things like that. So something like walking, uh, low exertion would be fine. Once the battery pack is put in after the second surgery, we don't want you doing like bench pressing or lifting things over overhead. Um, so I would plan on, I don't know, six weeks of kind of uh, light duty or, or non-strenuous exercise. Once you're healed up, it's just kind of common sense restrictions where you can go back to normal life. All right, well, thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.